In these uncertain days, there is a person who offers peace. His name is Jesus. People from all walks of life are gathering in his house to hear from him. It's time for you to join the movement. So today we come to the city, we come to the city of Ephesus, and I want to talk about with you today, defeating the darkness. Does anybody today find themselves fighting the darkness? Defeating the darkness. Here's what the Bible says, chapter 18 and verse number 18. Say amen if you're there in the Word of God. Amen. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took his leaves of the brothers and sisters and set sail for Syria. And with him, remember this couple that he had been in business with in tent making, Priscilla and Aquila. And at Sicilia, he had cut his hair for he was under a vow. And the scripture says, and they came to, what's the city? Ephesus. The Bible tells us that Ephesus was a very difficult place. When, when Paul was actually in Ephesus, he, was, he wrote a letter to the Corinthians. Now, look on the screen. Look what he said to them as he wrote to them. It's, it's from 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 9. Here's what it says. For a great and effective door has opened to me. But notice this. There are many what? Or enemies or darkness. And back in 1 Corinthians 15 and 25, Brother Dan, he said this. He said, if Christ be not risen, then why in the world did I, did I fight with beasts at Ephesus? Ephesus was a difficult place, but it's amazing that God had called him to that city, that he would do a great work, that they would defeat the darkness. Now think about this. They're not the only church that ever did it at Ephesus. I want you to know it was a long time ago. It was in 1851. It was November the 27th when a group of people got together in a small city, and they decided they did this crazy thing that they were going to constitute a church. Less than nine months later, that same group of people had grown to seven. It was 1852. And that group of people built their first building. And I watch this. That first building, Brother Jamie, was totally lit by candles. That, that building was the first Baptist church of Jackson, Georgia. Thanks be unto God we're still not in the candles. Amen? And thank the God we have air conditioning, all these things. But there's a principle there as they were founded together that Jesus said, Matthew 5 and 16, he said this. He said, let your light shine before who? Before men and the world, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, I want to I ask you this today. What are you fighting against? What is it that hell has come against? Maybe it might be your family, it might be your finances, it might be your health, it might be your job, it might be the friends around you, it may be children, it could be any, anything that you might think about. The enemy comes against you, but the Scripture is going to teach us today that you and I have the ability to defeat the darkness. Here's a verse I want you to write down, Isaiah 59 and 19. It's not on the screen. I want you to write this down. When the enemy comes in like a flood, anybody ever experienced that? Sadly, over 20,000 people in Libya this week experienced that. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard, now listen to this, against him. What I've discovered is this, that, that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that when we embrace it as God intends us to be, and we are people of a movement, darkness has to flee. Now we know this, if you just remove the darkness and don't replace it with anything, it'll come back even stronger so. So I want to ask you this today, what have you pushed back the darkness and replaced the darkness with? This is very important to us today. Paul came to the city of Ephesus, and here's what the Scripture says. When they came, he left them there. He left two individuals in the city of Ephesus, Aquila and Priscilla, and the Bible said this, and he went to the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking his leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills, and he set sail from Ephesus. Now think with me for just a moment. What has Jesus Christ left here upon the earth so that, that his presence and his power could be evidenced in the world? Here's what he's left. He's left his spirit. We just read that from Isaiah. But he's also left this. He's left us faith. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, it says this, This is the message that we have heard from him, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness. So Jesus Christ left us here with his presence called the Holy Spirit of God. And I'm here today to tell you this, that maybe you're going through something that's kind of clouding over against you. Now, how many of you know that when you, you establish something, that the enemy will try to de-establish what you've established? 
And I think that that may be true for some of you today. You've grown some in your faith. You're going forward in your faith. But all of a sudden, there's just kind of this darkness. You kind of, some would say you kind of hit a, hit a speed bump for a moment in your life. Well, I want to encourage you today. Here's a verse to write down. Psalm chapter 3 and verse 3. I've been singing this psalm all week long. And aren't you glad you are not with me because I can't sing a lick. In Psalm chapter 3 and verse 3, you may know it. You, O Lord, are a shield to me. You're the glory and the lifter of my soul. This week, I've been just rejoicing and shouting before the Lord to know that even though there's darkness in the land, and some procrastinators would say that it's going to get worse, but I'm here to tell you something different, that I believe that, that a revival is coming to our nation. And I've seen it in many different places. We're seeing it in our own church of all that God is doing and in other churches. Yesterday, I talked to a pastor from a small community. I talked to him for about 20 minutes yesterday. He's been to this church, Brother Jimmy, 21 years. And he said when he went there, it was the most dark and divided place. And now it is light in the Lord. I want to celebrate with you today that darkness is not winning. Let's give the Lord a hand in his house. The darkness is not winning. So today, as we simply come to Ephesus with Paul, I'm just going to lay before your heart that if you want to not only push back the darkness, but if you want to win the darkness, overcome the darkness in the battles that you face in your life, no matter where you come from and what you're doing today, there's some things that I think are really important for you to do. Number one is this, Paul established a gospel presence in the city. When he came to the city, he left two people who were capable. Now watch, when we leave today, and we will leave here today, despite how long what the preachers are, we will leave today. We'll get in our connect groups and we'll do that. But we will leave today. But when we leave, listen to me, I can't go with you. Is that true? And some of you probably wouldn't want me to go because I eat too much or, or maybe something else. But, but as you leave to go, now watch, if you're in Christ, wherever you're going, you're trying to establish something. You're trying to establish the presence of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this, where do you need to put the gospel down? Where is it that you need to put the gospel down in your life? Paul took his leave, and he returned. He said, now watch what he said in verse 21. He said, I'll return to you if God wills. Seven days from now, if the Lord wills, you and I will gather again. Amen? I plan to be here. It's already on my calendar. I, I, I'm preaching here on Wednesday, Wednesday in, our, in our area that we're doing on Saturday night. I'm, a, I'm over at Harvest Church preaching at a men's conference here Sunday morning, another church on Sunday night speaking as well. I have the So I've got the, all my schedule. Thursday and Friday, I'm going to True McCall. I'm on the board of directors there for, uh, for a trustee. We're meeting Thursday and Friday. So I've got all that in my mind, but it might not be the Lord's will. It might be that I'm going out of this earth. I may not make it to this afternoon. But if the Lord wills, so listen to me. What is it that the Lord wills for your life? He wills that there would be a gospel presence in your life. He wills that you would establish it in this city. I believe this, that the best days of this church are still ahead. If you tracked our history, and I have because I, I love history, and I've tracked the history of Jackson First Baptist Church, we have had highs and we've had lows. We've always gotten up to a certain level, and hear me, we are at the highest level this church has ever been. We are at the highest level this church has ever been, and because we are there right now, the devil is saying, i got to shut it down. And you are a part, by the way, of it overcoming, but you have to establish, not here, because it's already established here in the building. We've established that, and for 10 years, and really since 1851, there's been a few little moments that it kind of waned for a while, but since 1851, the light of the gospel has been proclaimed from this group of people in this church. And I celebrate that, but I'm telling you the gospel presence that has to be established is now is in your home. But before that, it has to be in your heart. So just really quickly, let me say this to you very quickly with this. I, I want you to hear this. Before that you can watch this, take authority, you have to give over authority. Before you can take authority in anything else, I was reading this this week, and it's so real in my heart. Jesus said in Matthew 10 and 39, Jesus said this to a group of his disciples, if you keep your life, you'll lose it. 
But if you'll give me your life, then you will be able to keep it because I'm going to give you a life that's great, great, great productivity. So I'm telling you today, if you've never given over authority of your life to Jesus, you'll never take authority and establish his light in the world. But not only must you give over authority, you must also embrace authority. You say, what do you mean? You must embrace the authority of a biblical worldview. You must believe what the Bible says. Christian Headlines this week had a, had a shocking discovery in one of their surveys. Here was the survey. They, they asked Christian parents who have kids, Christian parents who have kids 12 years old, like some of you up there and some others, that, and younger, what, did they have a biblical worldview? You say, what's a biblical worldview? It's the view of 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for all things. So you, you, your life is under the authority and you embrace that. But listen to me, it shocked my heart. Less than 10% of the people, Brother Jimmy Bryant, that they polled, Christian people said, less than 10% that they believed in a biblical worldview and everything in life. So you want to know why there's darkness in homes, why there's darkness in schools, why there's darkness on the streets? It's because we say that we have given authority to God, but we haven't embraced the authority. Can I tell you where I'll preach next Saturday night, and while I'll preach next Sunday night, there will be the authority of God. I'll carry it with me, and I promise you this, that I'll be faithful to preach the Word of God. But more than that, in my own home, we are practicing the Word of God. Where we work, we are practicing the Word of God. When Paul went to Ephesus, he could leave the, this, this team together because he knew that they were established. Now watch this. You have to give authority before you can take authority. You have to embrace authority. But thirdly, you've got to do this. You've, you've got to walk in the Spirit. Because, listen to me, it is the Spirit that defeats the enemy. It is not you. You may walk up and say, I'm done with it. I'm not going to do that anymore. And the enemy rushes back in. But when the Spirit goes before you, Galatians 5 and 25, you keep in step. And hallelujah, the darkness has no power. Now, y'all quit looking at me like a mule looking at a gate this morning. Come alive, because I'm going to tell you that you have the power if you will go home today, if you'll go home like one person did and claim their neighbor's house, walked around the outside, they didn't even know they were doing it. They walked around the perimeter and claimed it for the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your hand upon your grandchildren, up on your children, up on your friends, and up on your neighbors and claim them. Claim them for Jesus. Claim them in the Word of God and claim them for the Spirit of God. And I'm telling you, the city will change. And this is what happened here. The Bible said in verse 22, when he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church. He went down to Antioch after spending some time there, and he departed from one place to the next with the region of Galatia, Persia, strengthening all the disciples. Now, while Paul was going doing his missionary journey, going back to Antioch to be encouraged, he's kind of pausing from his third missionary journey. While he's doing that, all this great work is going on. And for example, maybe you might have gotten that 30 seconds this week to rest. Or maybe you got to go on a little bit of a vacation. While you were doing that, do you know the church of Jesus was moving? There was just movement everywhere. God was working and he was reaching and he was touching. And so the Bible says this, and you know that? Well, God will couple you with other people as you go forward who also are like bears. Here's what the Scripture says. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, he came, the Bible said this, he came to Ephesus. He was an elegant man, competent in the Scriptures. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he was fervent in spirit. He spoke and talked accurately the things concerning Jesus. Now there's a footnote here in the Scripture. Though he only knew the baptism of John. Which simply means this, that when John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, came, Matthew chapter 3, he, he preached repentance, that they would repent for the kingdom of God was coming, and that Jesus was coming. They were repenting, saying, God, I believe you are coming. I'm looking forward to what you're going to do. And so this man knew that only. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But now notice this, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, have you ever heard anybody? But have you understood what they've said? 
In Matthew 13, the parable of the sower, there's some soul that's, that, that is so hard-hearted that, that the gospel can't get through. And I, I see that everywhere. There, there also there is the superficial heart that, that they say, I want Jesus, but as soon as a trial or tribulation comes, they fall away. There, there is the heart that's a sensual heart. There, there's so much clutter and that they cannot ever stay with it. One week they are and one week they're not. But then there's the good soul. And so here the man of God was preaching, and as Priscilla and Quilla heard him, they realized something, that this man needed help. So the, the Bible says this, they heard him, they took him before Facebook. They took him before a committee. They embarrassed him. No, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now, I want you to hear this. If when we establish a gospel presence, if we're going to push back the darkness, there's a, there's a little hard thing we have to do too as well. You'll have to correct some error in your life. There'll be some things that you'll have to correct so that people can believe accurately the Word of God. Now, you say, for example, if I, if I, I don't understand something accurately, then I'm in trouble. And what I find today is this, is that we go, many of us, to churches and we read the Bible in such a superficial way, that, but we never really get anywhere because we haven't been taught accurately the Word of God. You say, well, what do you mean? Let's read on together. And, and when he wished to go to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. Now notice what he now does. He powerfully refuted the Jews in public. He showed them by the Scriptures that Christ was who? Jesus, or the Messiah. Now notice chapter 19, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth, while he was doing ministry where Paul had been before, that Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. And there he comes to this place, and it is a wicked place, one of the most wicked places of it. It had over 50 different temples to 50 different fertility gods. And he came to this place, and the Scripture says, and he found, and he found some disciples in verse 1. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, for we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said then, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. Now wait for just a moment here. You think back to what we've just read, how that Apollos had preached John the, John the Baptist's message. And these men apparently began to follow Apollos because Apollos was telling them all that he knew to tell them. How many of you before coming to Christ told people all that you knew to tell them? And even after coming to Christ, uh, you were a babe in Christ, and there was just so much you could tell somebody because this is as far as you'd ever gone. It's kind of like someone who's never had a child. They just know so much about parenting, don't they? Amen? They know all about it. And they can tell you all about parenting until they what? Until they have a child. And when they have a child, it all changes, and you get your foot out of your mouth and realize you need the help of God. Amen? You need the help of God in your life. And so here Paul is, and he's asking, asked them this question about what they knew, and, they said, and Paul said to them in verse 4, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. Now notice this, that is who? Jesus. Jesus the Christ. They said, now listen, John the Baptist came and said, there's going to be a Messiah who is coming, and you were baptized in hopes that he was coming. And I want to tell you what he did not know. For some reason, Apollos had not heard the rest of the story. And he simply says this, Pastor Rick, he leans into him and says, Hey, Jesus is that Messiah. That's right, when we go overseas, all of our mission partners, when we're in Malawi, when all the places that we go, we tell people that as they are following Allah, that Allah is really not God, and that Muhammad is maybe his dead prophet, but the true Messiah is Yahweh, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He is our Messiah. And I want to tell you this, when you go and correct error in people's lives, they will come to know Jesus Christ. But if you just sit there and say, that's okay, and agree with everything they say, they're never going to come to know the truth. See, the truth of the matter was these people did not know any better. They, they had not heard about Pentecost. They had not heard the truth that, that Paul would write to the Corinthians in chapter 12 and verse 3 says, No one can call Jesus Lord apart from the Holy Spirit. 
They did not know that the Holy Spirit gives everyone at the moment of their salvation. They didn't know that. They didn't know that at all. And they didn't know that Jesus had come to be the Messiah. But as soon as they heard it, the Bible says this, on hearing this, in verse number 5, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. I want to ask you this day, is there anything that you need to correct in your life? I meet folks oftentimes, we'll have them in the second service today. They've prayed to receive Christ, but they've never been baptized. Some of them are waiting for someone else to get baptized. Some of, some of them are afraid of water. Some of them are just saying, I, I, I'm waiting for a more accurate time. But the reality is you can never take a second step until you take the first step. And when people do not take that public step of baptism with God, here's where they are in their life. There's something that they haven't done, and because of that, there's not the power released. Because if I'm disobedient in one thing with God, I'm not in perfect fellowship with Him. And so God says the first thing you are to do after receiving Christ is to take a public step of faith. And so next weekend, we're going to have that wonderful miracle time. We already have, a, have four people now. We're going to baptize in both services. And if you are a person who needs to get your baptism correct, you need to be baptized. You need to get it correct with God. Listen to me. There's a QR code right there in your bulletin. Click it right now. You can out your phone and do that and sign up for next week. Call us at the office. See me after the service. Because it is something that you need to do and correct before Almighty God. Because I'm telling you, I look back to the day I was saved, but I also look back to the day that before my friends, my classmates, before my parents, and before Almighty God, I said, God, I'm going to come out of the darkness, and I'm going to come out into the public, and I'm going to follow Him in this most wonderful joyous identifying with Christ. It doesn't save me, but it tells everybody else I'm on God's side. And so I'm going to ask you to take that stand for if you have not for the Lord Jesus Christ. Or if you were baptized uh, but, and then got saved later, that's not your baptism, that you were just getting wet. You thought you knew, but now you know. And the Scripture says here that after that happened, and then went verse number, number 6, and when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. You'd say now, oh, ho, ho, so, so I'm missing something right now. You, there are those who are wrongly. We've got to correct the error. You see, at the time of the New Testament, in every region where the gospel come, that began, they authenticated Jesus in the gospel with the Holy Spirit evidence in them in that moment to say this is real. But once we had the Bible completed, never again does God do it that way. He says, at the moment of your conversion, I give it all to you. Because I don't just need half of it when I get saved. I can't get on to the next step without Him. And so listen to me today, that was what was happening then. And so the Scripture says for the next few months, Paul stays in that city, and the miraculous happens. So let me ask you this today. Are there things in your life that need to be corrected? It's not in your notes. Or maybe, maybe it actually is in your notes. Uh, some people wrongly believe things like this as it comes on the screen. Some people believe prayer, that all you got to do to be saved is to pray a prayer. Just repent. And now that you're saved, doesn't matter how you live after. Is that what the Bible says? The Bible doesn't say that. In Mark 4, Jesus literally says, take up your cross and follow me. In the book of Ephesians that Paul writes to them, he says in chapter 4, verses 17 through 19, he says, the ways of the Gentiles are wicked and evil, that they are sensual, they are sinning against God, adulterous. But you have not learned Christ that way. But now that you've come to Christ, take off your old life and strive for the new. Some people wrongly notice this. They say this, God's grace is free. So I'm free to live as I want to. Friend, that's not what the Bible says. Now that you've come to Christ, you've identified with Him in baptism, the Holy Spirit God in your life, you're under authority. Friend, listen to me. I've been married to one woman for 31 years because that's what the Bible says. Hallelujah. Not only that, I, I don't live my life in adultery. I don't live my life cheating and stealing. I don't live my life in the darkness. I live my life in the light. I want to be more like Christ, not less like Christ. Some people wrongly say this, God loves me just as I am. So I prayed, I, I'm a member of the family of God, but listen to me, and He accepts me just as I am. Well, the song says, just as I am without one plea. But the song also says that I give myself over to God. In Romans 1, it tells us this, that unless you turn to the Lord, if you continue to live in ungodliness and unrighteousness, it's a sign that, that you're not saved. It's kind of like being this. It's like saying, I'm a Chevrolet fan. I love Chevrolet products, but everything I drive is a Ford. What would that be saying? 
And by the way, I am a Chevrolet fan. If you pull up in our driveway by the grace and the mercy, and I love Ford people. they all on strike right now. I love off, off of just what I grew up with. So let me ask you this. When someone looks at you, is, are there things that need to change? Or can they say, there's where the gospel presence is. There's where a man's loving his wife. He's leading his home in care. There's where a woman is. She's separated unto God. Where children are, they're not perfect, but they're progressing in their family. Listen to me. You push back the darkness when God corrects in your life and you take authority over what used to take authority over you. And so there Paul had been for a few months, and, and I want to skip down to verse 11, and the Scripture says, and God was doing extraordinary miracles. God was doing extraordinary miracles. When was the last time that you heard somebody give a miracle story? Can I tell you, yesterday for me. The day before and the day before, God is doing extraordinary things. God is doing extraordinary things. And please listen to me. God expects you and I as believers, now listen to this, to be people, and I watch this, who change. God does expect us to change. Now think about this, and we need to move along to where we are in our time together. God says this, that Paul established the gospel presence. He corrected gospel error. But thirdly, I love this, Paul experienced the supernatural power of God. God works in the most strange way. He works through food pantries. He works through Wednesday night Bible study. He works through you paying somebody's electric bill. He works through you going to their home and feeding them. He works through a nurse. He works through a doctor. He works in any way that he wants to. And so I want to tell you this today, that they did extraordinary miracles. So I want to ask you this today, what's extraordinary in your life? I want to tell you 60, 80 hours working away at your job is not something of a miracle. It's what the society has pushed us into. It's not what society has pushed us into. Working hard and killing yourself and, and making things happen yourself is not extraordinary. There's an illustration here in the text uh, that they, there was a group of exorists or guys that were going around. They, they were of the occult and, and they would say, if you give me money, I'll pray for you and, and you'll be healed. It started right here, not our day. They were the sons of Sceva, this Jewish priest, and they, they thought that, that they could say the name of Jesus over a man that was demon-possessed, and that they could actually win the battle. And some of you today really thought that you established the gospel, that you prayed a prayer, and, that, and you got a Bible, and you just read the Bible without understanding it, that you'd win the war, but now you're about in the middle of something that you're going to have to have a miracle. The Bible says they went in to this person that's demon-possessed, and they said, in the name of Jesus, demon, you be gone. I love what the text says. The text says this, Paul we know, Jesus we know, but who the devil are you? And they jumped on them, and they, and they beat them and tore their clothes off of them. I used to say, preacher, do you believe in demons? As sure as I'm standing here, because the Bible does. And they threw them out. I want to tell you that, that God sometimes has to break us before He can do the extraordinary. So, sir, I've been praying for you. If you don't believe in miracles, if, you are, if you've quit believing and trying to rationalize everything, you're praying against your pastor. If, that's who you, if you're a totally rational guy that don't believe in the extraordinary, you're about to get run over, man. Because God is about to do a work, and He is doing a work in this church that's beyond anything that we can. It's already beyond me. What we're doing right now is all the way beyond me. It's beyond my ability and my power, and I'm sensing and seeing what God is going to do and is doing. And the Scripture says, now listen, when the city heard what was going on, that they came, the people that had believed already, you know what they did, uh, Brother Jeremy came? They came and brought their books on sorcery. They brought all of their idols, all of their cult practices, and they burned, brought it to the center of the city, and they began to burn it, and it was worth over 50,000 pieces of silver. Remember what Paul said, a great and effective door is open to me, 1 Corinthians 16 and 9. And there's many adversaries. So here's my simple question, I'm done. Who will do what God says and walk through the door of faith? Where do you need a gospel presence? Get up and leave here today and go claim it. 
Who here needs to correct something in your life? I don't know what it is for you today. I'm just encouraged that you can push back. If you correct that one thing, it may be the last thing that the devil has any foothold in your life. It may be as a simple thing as drinking, smoking. It may be the simple thing of lying. It may be the simple thing of watching pornography. It, it may be the simplest of things that God's told you to do something you're not doing. And I think for many of us, it may be the, that gigantic thing that you've quit giving to God out of your time, talent, and treasure. And God simply says, do it again. And then for some of you, you know what you just need to do? You need to get up before God and say, God, do the impossible. So First Baptist families, we go to a time of invitation. What will you do? I pray that you walk through the door of faith. Thank you for joining the movement. We hope that you would reach out to us at info at jacksonfbc.com with your questions and check out more of our ministries at jacksonfbc.com.